um, thank you so much. I, I had this uh, lovely moment in the middle of your talk when uh, I was thinking earlier about AI, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm really interested in that, because I heard this very intelligent uh, man on the, on the radio a few months ago talking about it, and then uh, I realized it was you. <laughs> so uh, um, my, um, my own efforts uh, um, are, are uh, definitely relatively minor. I, I, I really do uh, want to emphasize the point that this is one of the most interesting and important issues that we face as a culture, um, uh, I think, as well as just a, a, a pure civilization. So thank you for, for a great presentation. I, I want to talk um, uh, in a much smaller way about a little segment of uh, what is maybe could be understood as the same story, which is the question about how we relate technology, uh, which is different from us, uh, to us, and to our civilization and culture and values, and how those two things come together, uh, sometimes in extreme situations. Uh, in doing so, in the next uh, 19 minutes, I'll uh, connect uh, the book that I uh, published in 2011 to a book that I'm about to publish and to my current work actually as an architect and a designer. As an architect, I'm interested in space um, uh, in some ways uh, because it's very different from the space that architects normally deal with, which is the space of uh, rooms and uh, landscapes and cities. Uh, the first person to use the capital S space versus the small s space was actually Milton in Paradise Lost to describe the space between worlds occupied by angels. Um, the word space in the 20th century acquired a range of different meanings in different scientific disciplines, but the most um, uh, constant, the constant between all those definitions, is it's defined as the threshold um, which we need technology in order to cross. So uh, an interesting thing happens, of course, then when you look at the human body in space, is that you discover really what is essentially an inky backdrop, empty before we're there, but against which we project all of our hopes and aspirations about technology and our relationship to it. And 2001 is a fantastic example. Um, what we find when we look at this artifact, the Apollo spacesuit worn by Armstrong and Aldrin on the surface of the moon, um, uh, is something that I want to talk to you about at the beginning of the talk today. I'm, I'm not actually even the first architect to think about this. The uh, great writer for The New Yorker and uh, urbanist Lewis Mumford in his big epic book, The Pentagon of Power, uses this as the frontispiece and gives it as an example. Uh, 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 talks about Gus Grissom in his Mercury spacesuit as an embryo, helpless in the embrace of technology, which is not quite the story that I want to tell you although it is a closely related one. Of course, the rocket that uh, uh, Gus Grissom was on was not, in fact, a, um, uh, something designed heroically to launch human beings into space, but something designed not so heroically to launch nuclear war warheads across the Earth, um, uh, a ballistic missile. And the, uh, uh, the ballistic missile is the source, uh, um, via Norbert Wiener, of a very interesting and important concept in our contemporary reality, which is the notion of, um, uh, as was discussed in the previous talk, optimization, uh, uh, operations research, but what um, has been given the name also systems engineering. Systems engineering was invented um, uh, as a practical discipline in the context of the invention of ICBMs by um, Simon Ramo, Dean Woolridge, and Bernard Shriver, a uh, uh, US Army general and um, uh, failed architect in the 1930s, who um, uh, uh, brought us this notion that uh, instead of making the uh, uh, Atlas ICBM as a single object, as previous military artifacts had with an X prototype and then the final thing, it would be instead constructed as a series of relationships between systems and amongst systems, as a system of systems. And the word system was so unusual in the English language in this context that when it was first, systems engineering was first proposed, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the 1954 memorandum, the word system was given a two-page long definition, uh, <laughs> such as the New York State Railway System or the Solar System. Systems engineering um, gave you the ICBM. It also gave you, quite inevitably, the arms race, as uh, all these independent systems could be upgraded without um, uh, uh, altering the integrity of the, of the object. And, um, it gave you, uh, and it was in that context, of course, that uh, Dwight Eisenhower coined the phrase military-industrial complex, which he originally wanted to call the military-industrial-academic complex, but uh, the speechwriter told him that that was too long. Um, 
And the um, uh, systems engineering gave you a small fragment of the picture of it, the first vision of how mankind would enter space. Uh, uh, two uh, psychopharmacologists who had in invented and introduced the first antidepressant and the first anti-schizophrenic drug in the United States uh, were contracted by the Air Force to study the problem of man in space and invented this neologism of the cybernetic organism or cyborg, the notion of a human body whose systems were treated just like a, uh, an atlas ICBMs and swapped out for ones that were more favorable or conducive to going in space. The skin made of steel, the heart uh, made of a pump, etc., etc. United Aircraft was given a whole bunch of money to study it. Um, it was proved, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, more complex than was anticipated. Um, uh, what happened instead, at least in the first years of the space program, was that the contract uh, for studies of spacesuits was given to large military industrial complex, com uh, military industrial corporations like Litton Engineering who uh, invented this series of hard, one-piece prototype spacesuits for the Air Force. What actually happened was something slightly different. Uh, instead of being made in a hard, one-piece assembly by military industrial, complex, uh, uh, mil military industrial suppliers, the spacesuit worn on the surface of the moon was made instead by the Playtex Bra Company, um, or International Latex Corporation, as its parent corporation was grandly known. Um, and instead of being uh, machined and engineered, it was hand-stitched out of 21 layers of fabric by um, female garment workers taken from the assembly lines, the bra and girdle assembly lines of Playtex. And um, the problems, what is most interesting uh, 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 is the problems, or at least the, the uh, particularly interesting to me, are the problems of translation across this divide between the rest of the systems engineering enterprise of NASA, which was very successfully putting together a large um, uh, rocket and series of structures to go to the moon, and the way in which these spacesuits were assembled very different. Um, uh, I will give you two problems in translation that they had uh, as examples. The first was sizing all the parts of the suit. When you change something in a systems engineering context, you renumber it, you redesignate it. It's very important that everyone know that you've modified it. In a, a, a sewing context, uh, you're changing stuff and finessing stuff all the time. And so one of the ways which, in which after two years of paperwork and battles this was resolved was that the suit parts could be generally designated like clothing, a large, a medium, and a small. Although after uh, an incident with the first astronaut fitted, the urinary collection device was sized large, extra large, extra, extra large. <laughs> <laughs> the second example, um, more interesting uh, even to an architect, is that the, um, uh, the suits, uh, it was required in uh, ILC's contract with NASA that they draw uh, a series of um, uh, engineering drawings of how the suit was assembled. No such drawings existed or were actually used in the process of its assembly. There were patterns, but all the knowledge of how the parts came together in space did not exist as a, as a document that was followed, but rather as kind of ingrained knowledge in a series of highly expert craft workers who put the thing together. NASA insisted that drawings had to be produced, and they were, but only in 1974, long after the uh, suits had come, come to the moon and back, and only through a process of dissecting suits that were assembled and drawing them as they uh, uh, as the pieces came together. So in, in this, the drawings actually share a very important pro property, not with architectural drawings, which always draw something that we would like to, to a reality as we would like it to be brought into existence, or as we might think it could be brought, brought into existence, but rather something like a city plan here, Giambattista Noli's famous map of Rome of the 17th century, which ruthlessly recorded all the buildings of the city as they were actually built, uh, and, and give a kind of organic slice through the city's own tissue. So what we have in the Apollo spacesuit, to bring the first half of this highly extended lecture to a close, is a, a, a really interesting situation of interface or media in the classic sense of something that comes in between something and something else. Something that shared properties, of course, with the enormous military industrial assemblage of which it was a part, but also shared essential qualities of a kind of epidermal adaptive structure with the body which it protected. 
So media um, uh, is an interesting word in this context. Of course, the entire space program was devoted to a, the production of a single mediated image, a television uh, picture of an American on the moon, um, discussed by uh, Lyndon Johnson with Frank Stanton, uh, president of CBS, as part of the decision to go to the moon, the very initial part of the process. And it is through the vast investment uh, of the uh, military industrial complex of the space age that we get many of our contemporary media, including the media of my own profession, design. Uh, not just screens, but uh, early uh, uh, tools for mapping and charting objects in space. Uh, also through techniques of simulation, which were initially analog, but then had to become digital in order to simulate the manifold different possibilities that the astronauts might be constructed to. This is the first 3D landscape encountered, uh, digital landscape encountered by human beings, part of the lunar um, uh, landing simulator. Um, but then also the media of how cities are made. And we don't actually have to go through a vast process of kind of translation or metaphor to make this link that I already made between cities and bodies. Because in fact, uh, what, one of the things that happened uh, almost from the very origin with all of the technologies of the space age was that they returned from what was seen as one great problem of the age in the 1960s to what was seen as the other great problem of the age, the problem of the city. And Hubert Humphrey, when Hubert Humphrey announced in uh, 1967 that the same techniques that were going to land a man on the moon were going to solve the problems of American cities, he was doing what politicians always do, which is take credit for something that was already happening. Um, already, by 1967, the lunar landing simulator was being used to picture the result of modernist planning proposals for downtown Los Angeles. Joint HUD NASA symposia on science and city were translating between the, complex, the, the perceived complex problems of designing a space program or spaceship and analyzing and, and influencing problems for the city. NASA's first director of nuclear propulsion research, Howard Finger, who actually designed the nuclear propelled spacecraft that Kubrick used as the prototype for the discovery in 2001, became HUD's um, first director of research, pioneering a program that he called, uh, that was called Operation Breakthrough, uh, prototyping prefabricated housing and simulated uh, uh, and digital parametric design of whole communities, of which uh, six were actually built. And um, I probably don't need to tell you uh, in this context that this program was um, uh, remarkably unsuccessful and was in fact cited by the General Accounting Office for not achieving any of its goals. In fact, most of the uh, 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 enormously um, uh, ambitious Operation Breakthrough test sites um, uh, failed uh, uh, quite interestingly in their infrastructure and uh, proposals for creating cities from scratch. The Jersey City Operation Breakthrough site had a experimental pneumatic sewage system that worked very well, but in the opposite direction than it was supposed to. <laughs> um, and um, maybe the most interesting uh, uh, kind of site for uh, these uh, prefabricated housing proposals was in this uh, um, uh, 1960, uh, 1972 proposal from NASA Ames for a 10,000 person settlement uh, at Lagrange Point 5 between the Earth and the Sun, um, uh, uh, settled by 10,000 people from Western ind industrialized nations and governed according to principles from government and industry. <laughs> Which is to say, a kind of utopia or place that doesn't exist and couldn't exist. Uh, nowadays, in the last six minutes of my talk, we are faced in architecture and urban design with a different kind of uh, technological utopia, but one which is closely related. A whole series of discourses and conversations uh, around what has been called the smart city, which is to say the, the, uh, the various ways in which government and industry is going to be able to use technology to create perfect, balanced communities. Uh, this, the, the uh, city, new city of Mazdar, various other uh, digital proposals more um, uh, successful within architectural culture than outside of it about how optimization and uh, uh, all the tools that, that um, computers allow us to do uh, to, to, to engage with can be used to optimize urban form. But of course, uh, the city, uh, like the human body, uh, is not necessarily susceptible to optimization and shouldn't be uh, uh, understood as a problem, as a thing that can necessarily be perfected. Uh, this is, in fact, um, uh, the human body 
uh, it's now being uh, seen uh, that much like the city is in fact an assemblage of millions and billions of individual actors, just like all the microbiome of your body, whose riotous interaction over time produces the homeostasis and resilience and robustness that we take for granted in our own lives and even in cities. Because, of course, we're at a time of great challenge to the city, a great challenge in city making and a great challenge in the future of the city. We will build as much urban fabric in the next 35 years as we have in the previous 10,000 years of human history combined. Uh, uh, and of course, this is happening at the same time. Uh, most of it will look like this, not like this, because of the nature of where and how that expansion is happening. And of course, we're increasingly dependent on legacy pieces of infrastructure which are being poorly maintained at the same time as climate change means that cities are much more likely to be exposed to unpredictable and unforeseen and unforeseeable um, uh, events. What to do about this? I don't have the whole answer, but I will show you in the last four minutes the very small uh, answer of my own research and how I try and think about this. How I think about, try and think in particular about how the explosion in the information we have about the city can be used not to optimize urban form or optimize urban systems, but rather to contribute to, build upon, and replicate the, uh, all the enormous network of interactions that make our cities um, uh, resilient and robust to begin with. So let's get through this. So um, the work. Uh, uh, my design work of the last uh, five or six years has focused on the potential to connect two very different pieces of technology, both of which come out of the, the mid-60s. On the one hand, um, uh, what are sometimes called parametric design tools, building tools that contribute to what's called building information modeling today in architecture, or the, the ability to, to, to program and, and make uh, explicit relationships between many different parts of a complex system and have that complex system sort itself out for a whole variety of contexts very powerfully. Uh, the second is very different uh, technology, uh, geographic information systems, um, uh, which allow us to know more than we ever have in more precise ways about lots of different parts of our environment. Uh, I developed a small piece of software that allows these two things to, to talk to each other, and I prototyped it through a study uh, uh, of uh, pieces of the city that nobody thinks uh, are necessarily valuable. In the 1970s, it took the artist Gordon Mattaclark three years to find 15 small vacant sites in New York that became an artwork, famous artwork, Fake Estates, Reality Properties. Uh, now we can find, uh, uh, well, I can find here in this slide about 4,000 sites. Uh, I'm working with um, a series of urban ecologists now uh, in New York who found up to 30,000 sites in New York. And this is not uh, a problem unique to New York. In San Francisco, we've looked at um, uh, almost 2,000 what are called unaccepted streets, small um, uh, pieces of land that are owned by the city and zones of right of way as right of way, but not used or maintained as rights of way. These um, uh, sites overlay a whole set of uh, negative health and social indicators, um, like crime, respiratory hazards, and so forth. They also overlay um, uh, this, the, the city's most paramount ecological problems, like the urban heat island, and um, as well as the uh, impedances in the, in the stormwater system. What this work, which is called Local Code, is an argument about fundamentally, about addressing one problem with the other, using our infrastructure dollars to promote resilience, not just uh, physically uh, or ecologically, but also socially and economically. So uh, taking existing funds that are used for big things, like increasing the capacity of San Francisco's stormwater system, and using it, a uh, portion of those funds instead, for a whole bunch of small-scale interventions, not just because little neighborhood parks make us feel good, but it turns out they can do some of the most important ecological and physical work in the city. So that's the work, and I will just fast forward. Um, this work has been a series of museum installations, a series of studies in LA. We looked at land underneath billboards. Um, Venice, as part of the uh, 2012 Venice Architecture Biennale, we looked at the abandoned islands of the Venetian Lagoon, which were a crucial part of the city's historic ecology, and are now vacant. And then finally, um, back in New York, uh, looking at over 30,000 sites, and 
This will be uh, a book coming out from Princeton Architectural Press in February, if I finish it this month. <laughs> and um, uh, also now a series of, of uh, collaborations with NGOs and uh, the New York City Mayor's Office to actually start to try and make some of this work happen. Thank you very much. <laughs>